so thank you very much for coming and, and now I know a little bit of your background so I will try to keep it as general as possible and um, maybe not go that much into detail um, and and I hope you you can then go to the resources that or the sources that I will give them at the end of this lecture to sort of uh, give you uh, an idea or an introduction on how uh, to uh, so where to go to read so basically what I want to do in this ring for liaison, I mean, I know you you come all from sort of a little bit different backgrounds of machine typing, uh, machine uh, learning and PDEs and algebraic geometry and so on, gauge theory, as uh, Shuhan said. But uh, what I would like to give you is just a general overview of what is, so what, what are sort of the, the interesting results? And, in, and with results, I mean, I mean, interesting in a very broad sense of non-commutative geometry and in the end i would also like to go to what applications does it have uh, in regards to physics okay and and because in a sense non -com so there are in, in physics we have this problem of um, you know finding the world formula as they say and and basically what what the the, the thing is is that we there are, there are different theories of course i mean uh, but what we would like to have is a theory that unifies in a sense quantum quantum mechanics with gravity because we have these two classical fundamental theories of physics that are sort of the fundamental pillars of, among which physics relies and uh, which one is gravity so it has to do with very massive um, objects that that have also a certain um, speed and then you have quantum mechanics which deals with things that are very very small and uh, you know on a subatomic level and we would like to, to uh, subatomic level, and we would like to connect those two theories, for example, to describe what happens near a black hole and stuff like that. And it is not clear how to do it, okay? So this is sort of a little bit what, uh, yeah, what differs a physical point of view from the mathematical one is that we don't know how to do it in the beginning. And um, right, and, and now, and we are trying sort of to, um, Right to 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 figure this out. Um, okay, sorry. So in a sense, there there are many um, many paths to that. So there is there is string theory, there is loop quantum gravity, and um, and a lot of paths. I mean, I cannot. I mean, one and a half hours wouldn't be enough to tell you about all the possible and um, all the possible paths that that want, lead, should lead us to a quantum theory of quantum gravity but one which i uh, followed during my i mean short career up to now is is the 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 path of non-commutative geometry and in in particular uh, rigorous deformation quantization i will explain what this is but in general i just want to give you an idea of what is non-commutative geometry what we deal with what um aspects are interesting and and can be applied sort of to any modern day uh, mathematics and and then try to to convince you in a sense uh, of what the physical um, motivation is to 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 work with that so um sorry i, I i'm i'm a bit annoying maybe but uh, could you tell me if you can see my screen so the so just a simple yes from anyone would suffice so the the pdf that yes. i opened yeah, we also see a mouse. You see the, the, the PDF and my mouse? Yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, so the, the nice thing about Zoom is that you can also do interesting stuff with it. So here, right, right, and spotlight. Okay. So, um, so I will give you first a, a mathematical teaser, sort of to non-commutative geometry, as I call it. Sorry. Um, right. Uh, spotlight. Okay. And right. And uh, so, in, so let's start with with what is geometry. I mean, I, I'm sure. Most of you have a better answer than I have to that, and and are pretty much more familiar with that. But but in in general, what what geometry what 
a fundamental aspect of geometry is the distance function. So you have, you know, these are sort of very nice um, graphs of different types of universes that we have, right? So uh, if, if the universe was a flat universe, if the universe was, you know, a hyperbolic one or a spherical one and so on, these are so, uh, so we have the, in, in, in general relativity, there is the so-called Friedman Robertson Walker model. And corresponding to that, there are different solutions of how the universe might look like, right? And, and in general, what, what, so the distance function is you have two points and you want to know the shortest path between from P, from P to K. So you have uh, the point P and you have the point Q and you want to know the short, shortest distance between these two points, okay? Now, the point is when we want to talk about or define it, I mean, from a physical perspective, when you want to define the theory of quantum gravity, um, it is, somehow ingrained in your mind or intuitively clear that the, the, the notion of a point will be missing. And that is due to quantum mechanics. So the question is, what happens to the distance function if the notion of a point is missing? So how, how would we still give you know, meaning to the word or to the, to the aspect of, or to the concept of, of distance? And so the two questions that I ask here is what happens if the notion of a point is missing? And how does one define the notion of a distance in such a setting? And one example how to do that is quantum mechanics. So, um, I mean, in quantum mechanics, sorry, it's not an example. In quantum mechanics, this is exactly what happens. You have, so just to explain to you, it to you broadly, um, you, you basically, in classical mechanics, you have some particle and it moves, you know, along a certain trajectory with uh, a certain uh, momenta, right? And the, the, if you collect the momentas and the coordinates of this particle, they make up what you know in, in mathematics or in symplectic geometry as the so-called phase space. But uh, in quantum mechanics, uh, you cannot, well, measure with absolute accuracy the, the momenta and the coordinate of a particle. Thus, you have to work Instead of working, you know, on a, on a classical symplectic manifold on a phase space, you work on a Hilbert space. So, um, and, and quantum mechanics basically is the fundamental theory describing dynamics and interactions on a subatomic level. However, um, you know, they, they are in such a way that they are not too, um, what do we call it? Um, well, not too quick. Okay. I mean, so, yeah, okay, that, that in, in, so you see in, in quantum mechanics, we have, um, well, in, in classical mechanics, things cannot become too quick because if, if, it, if the, the velocity reaches the point of uh, the speed of light, or I mean, is near the speed of light, then our classical concepts break down a little bit. And quantum mechanics takes into account sort of on a, uh, the physical aspect in a macroscopic level, but um, just quantum mechanics alone is sort of the classical aspect. So it does not take into account what happens if these subatomic particles move very quickly. For that, then you have relativistic quantum mechanics, which then turns on into um, relativistic quantum field theory. And, and that would be the more uh, fundamental theory for that. But I mean, in a certain aspect, quantum mechanics describes enough so that we can build a lot of stuff that we use on a daily basis and understand or yeah, misunderstand the world around us. So, so classically, you know, I, there is this, I mean, there are many pictures that they always draw to you when you, sorry, I just want to mention that as well. If, if, so this is more of, I am telling you the story of stuff and uh, I, I hope I can go a little bit deeper, but you can interrupt me anytime for any question so that we can also have a discussion. So since that aspect is obviously missing since we're not, you know, I don't see your faces and, and, and we're not physically uh, present. So um, classically you have the state space that is given by some symplectic manifold, which we sometimes call the phase space. And in quantum mechanics, this is replaced by the Hilbert space. Observables, that means things that I can observe and measure. Um, and they are, um, well, I mean, in, in classical mechanics, 
there isn't even a real difference between those two. In quantum mechanics, there's a whole lot of difference between observables or operators that represent observables and our measurements. But however, in classical mechanics or in classical physics, they are just given by classical functions on this phase space. And in quantum mechanics, they are given by unbounded operators defined on a dense subset of the Hilbert space. So, um, I mean, uh, since you're all mathematics students, basically, I'm pretty sure you had some, funda I mean, some, some uh, introductory course on functional analysis. However, could you, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, whatever. If there's any question, please, please don't, uh, don't, don't, uh, so just ask me. Okay, sorry, something is going on right now. Sorry, I'm having a little bit of problem with this thing. Oh, sorry, too much chat. Sorry, let me stop sharing for a second. Let's reshare again. Okay, um, right, so, so in the end, uh, the constituents, as I call them, in classical physics or classical mechanics are just some points, and in quantum mechanics, you replace this point aspect with states. Um, yeah, now, just an example, I mean, in, in classical mechanics, you have, let's say, the uh, symplectic manifold given by R2, so you have the coordinates X and P, and you have some function F and f of x and p that uh, sort of describes the dynamics of this particle. Now the observable x is identified with the coordinate and p with the momenta. And so and then you draw these nice phase space diagrams that you know tell you in, in, in principle to every point x and p you know sort of what the particle is doing or where the particle is. I mean that that is sort of the the um, the idea of a phase space and well it is the cotangent space of the co, co configuration space as well but that's maybe not that interesting and in general any i mean for our aspect so in, in general any choice of generalized coordinates xi define conjugate momenta okay so you have xi and pj in the poisson bracket are equal is equal to delta ij where i and j goes now from one to the dimension of of that um Right, and now, so, so this is the Poisson bracket and it is defined in, in a certain way where it's defined by the, by the derivatives with respect to one coordinate and the, res and the derivative with respect to another coordinate and they fulfill anti-commutativity, so they're anti-commutative. So xi Poisson bracket xi pj is equal to minus Poisson bracket pj xi. They're bilinear and they, uh, fulfill Leibniz, which is also very nice, so, and uh, the Jacobi identity. Okay. Now, in quantum mechanics, the point is you have, you have an analog of that, but in general, um, and, and this, is, this is in a sense really the, 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 the heart of quantum mechanics, is that the momenta and the, the, the coordinate do not commute. When, so do not commute, sorry, let me, Try to write here something. Um, can I? Yeah. So let me write it back. So the point is that you have you have these two coordinates, right? Or you have these two observables. Now there is a particle moving in some field, okay, around. Now you want to measure those, and the way I mean measurements are done, you do a lot of them. So let's say a hundred, a thousand. And then you take the mean value of that, and then there is an uncertainty also to that. But this uncertainty in classical worldview is just a probability issue, right? While in quantum mechanics, it's ingrained in the theory. So the, the uncertainty, so this basically translates to the uncertainty of the coordinate times the uncertainty of the momenta is always greater equal than a certain constant. This is called H bar, which is the Planck um, constant, which is, uh, it has some certain value, but it is very small, okay? 
So on a day-to-day -day level, you don't notice that you cannot put a particle in P equal to zero, and then you know exactly where the X of it is. So then the uncertainty of P is, is zero. So you don't notice it. But in, in quantum mechanics, in a sense, there, there, is a, there is a restriction to that. And, um, and this restriction, I mean, Heisenberg later on went uh, on to do this via ma matrix algebras because he realized, okay, matrix algebras are an example of algebras that are non-commuting. Oh, yeah, so the commutator of two operators, uh, for you who, who don't um, recall it, is basically A, so the commutator of A with B is equal to AB minus BA. Now, um, I don't know how familiar you are with functional analysis. As I said, please uh, interrupt me anytime you want. Um, so, so you, so here you have an abstract algebra. Usually, I mean, or this algebra is called the, so if you, you have two elements or three elements, actually there is also some, some sort of uh, unit element here. And this unit commutes with uh, all other elements of the algebra. Uh, this is so the, the, the collection of these three um, elements is called the Heisenberg group. So you can also have it here, it's the three-dimensional Heisenberg group. You can also have it for many more uh, dimensions, right? And, and since this is just an algebra and you want to work with it, in a sense, you want to take eigenvalues and, and, and uncertainties and uh, expectation values and so on. So things that in the end um, lead to a measurement that, that you can, um, well, that, that you can compare with other measurements in a sense to, to justify or to verify or falsify your theory. Um, so you need a representation of this algebra. And the representation, I will go into more detail. I will give more rigorous definition of a representation. But basically, a representation is you have pi and you have h, where, uh, so, so it's called, this is called a representation, where h is a Hilbert space and pi is, is a map from the abstract algebra. So let's call this abstract algebra h a. And pi is, uh, um, a linear map between H I and oh well I call it well and the Hilbert space well maybe it's not very good calling it that but whatever you know what I mean so it's it's basically a representation of the algebra on a Hilbert space and a faithful representation means that the kernel of this representation is equal to zero so it's, it's the map space and so so uh, we say so you, in order to represent this abstract algebra, uh, we use the, the Schwarz space, which is sort of a subset of the of H, which is, uh, let's take the square integrable functions on R, right? And okay, the Schwarz space, for those of you who are not that familiar with it, is just, the sp it's a space made out of all C infinity functions that uh, decay fast enough, even if you multiply them, by uh, various uh, polynomials of x and derivations, okay? So you take a function, it's C infinity, you can, uh, you can uh, put on it x of, of, of arbitrary polynomial and derivatives, and it still is uh, finite, okay? That, that makes the thing, I mean, a classical example for that is basically e to the minus x squared, okay, on R, let's say. That, that is a very nice Schwarz function. You see, if you differentiate, if you, first of all, it's square integrable, obviously. Um, second of all, you can always, so the differential and the, the, the multiplication with x basically does the same thing, but I mean, you can have here x to the n. So you see, if, if I der derivate e to the minus x squared, I get sort of polynomials of x uh, down and 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 it basically you will end up with an expression of x n where n is a multi index okay and then and this thing is still you know in the supremum um, finite now um, the, the way to represent those algebras is we say x acts as a multiplication operator and p as a derivation operator notice however if you work on r these operators are unbounded operators and for you who are familiar enough with functional analysis pretty much know that um, that 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 unbounded operators um, 
well, are a mess to deal with. But I mean, a famous uh, quantum physicist, uh, Hogg, once said that um, uh, it is an unfortunate fact of life that we have to deal with unbounded operators. But nevertheless, we have to. That is the, the, exactly the, the point. Be, because, I mean, they, you have to take more care of their domain and they don't have, for example, as in the case of bounded operators, uh, uh, a supremum norm defined to them, and so on and so forth. Now... Um, um, excuse me? Yes, I would have please. a short question. Yes. So, um, the representation, does it take values in H, so in the Hilbert space, or in the operators in the Hilbert space? Because, I mean, we kind of define x hat of phi. So, yes. like, yes. it is a function on the Hilbert space again, right? Okay. Or on the Schwartz the space. On the Hilbert space. So, you, you represent it as, well, I mean, so what, what is, I should have written here is the representation of this operator yeah. is as a multiplication operator on phi of x. But, uh, so, but what is the range space then of, of the representation? Ah, right. I mean, in this case, it is S of R, right? It is not the whole Hilbert space. So, so that's why I said I, I want to come to this uh, later. You see, the bounded for bounded operators, uh, you can say the representation of an algebra is, is basically just you take the algebra and you map it to to um, to the Hilbert space of bounded operators. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, my question was whether like pi of x hat. Yeah. Um, this is now an operator on the Schwartz space, right? Exactly. Okay, so it maps not to the Hilbert space, but to like an unbounded operator on the Hilbert exactly. space. Okay. Exactly. Yeah, right. So that is exactly the difference between bounded and unbounded operators. Bounded operators map to the Hilbert space. Unbounded mm -hmm. operators map to a subspace of the Hilbert space. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So actually, yeah. yeah, actually the, the representation, so it's a good question. And, and the, the representation theory of unbounded operators on a Hilbert space is, is not that very well treated in, um, in general literature, but there is a, a, an excellent book by, um, by Schmidtgen, Konrad Schmidtgen, who is also, I mean, I, I'm, I mean, probably you know him because he's a professor at the University of, of Leipzig in the math department. And he, he, has wrote, he has written a book about this. Um, I think it's called Un bounded operator theory on Hilbert spaces or so. And there is a, a whole chapter on, on that issue. So I, I can highly recommend it. I may also put it then in the references. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Um, making your drawings. Exactly, so, so the, the point is that, so from a physical aspect, I'm trying to switch back and forth between math and, and physics. This is the so-called uncertainty principle. So you cannot, you know, these commutator relations lead to uncertainty principle, which means you cannot um, measure uh, an observable as, as precise as you want. So the, the uncertainty is given by the expectation value of, of A square minus, so, of, so it's, it's just this formula, right? And and what this intuitively means is that the phase space, which was a, a space basically made out of points where you could reach any point if the, I mean, for the function f that describes the dynamics, is now replaced by a pointless, pointless state space with Planck cells. So no points exist anymore for that case. And, and you can imagine the, the replacement of the phase space where it was, you know, just a usual R2 by some sort of phase space that replaced the points by cells. And these cells have, you know, um, the size of H bar, okay? And the H bar is a very small constant, by the way. So it's 10 to the minus 34 uh, kilogram meter square per second. And which, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, it's very small. The point is if H bar would have been greater, then we would have noticed quantum mechanics in the world. Then quantum mechanics wouldn't be something that abstract or, or crazy to deal with. Um, right, what, okay, yeah, maybe that, that is enough said about that. And now, so let me, so I just, I mean, in a sense, explain to you the motivation. What is quantum mechanics? 
why do we need you know geometrical spaces uh, or or a geometrical notion of distance that does not rely on points and now let's try to so in a sense give you the teaser of what non commutative geometry does namely replace this notion of distance by um by a notion of 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 something more algebraic okay and for that we give you or i give you the the distance formula in commutative geometry let's let's go through that a little bit um Okay, so here the distance formula in commutative geometry, let's take an example. You have R, so the real line. I don't know why I'm drawing. Oh, this must be from the previous. Um, so, right, so you have this, the, the real line and you have P and Q. And the distance for of these two points is given by the distance function, which is basically the absolute value of P, of P minus Q, right? And another formulation exists for you uh, who are familiar with Riemannian geometry um, is, so in Riemannian geometry, the distance between two points, you know, given on a manifold is defined as the infimum of L of gamma, where gamma is a path joining P to Q and L is, um, so L is the length of, of of a certain sorry, I have a product here. So L of gamma is 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 a path gamma joining P is commuted from the metric G. Okay, this is what we sometimes also call the Lagrangian. And this is basically the the line element, we call it in, in physics. So G mu nu dx mu dx nu where mu and u go from one to d, where d is the dimension of the manifold, okay? So you have this, you, you, and you take the infimum of this, and then you have the distance function. So for example, the real line, you have r and delta, okay? So the metric, so the manifold is now given by r and delta. And, um, sorry, and, It's R and delta, and then you just insert this. So it's delta mu nu, dx mu, dx nu. Uh, and this is equal since delta mu nu or delta, I mean, you don't have a mu. Mu uh, goes here from one. So this is basically just dx squared. And you know the, the, the integral of that from q to p is p minus, p minus, minus q, right? Um, so if we move on here, sorry. Are you seeing this sort of bug here? Oh, this is weird. Um, so, so the supremum formulation, uh, so exactly. So there's another formulation of, of distances. So I gave you now a few ones of the infimum and, and there's also the supremum one where uh, distance on R is expressed as a premium taken over continuously derivable functions on R, okay? So you take f belonging to some um, continuous function that has a continuous derivative as well. And then you say the supremum over that, sorry, maybe I should, uh, excuse me. So uh, the supremum of f of p minus f of q and such that f uh, prime of x or the, the derivative of x is less equal than one for all x element r. So the primary objects here are observables f instead of points. Okay, this is sort of the, the nice thing about this supreme formulation. And that works. The advantage is does not use the concept of the path, you know, because path means geometry, geometry, and, and uh, path means metric. And in a sense, we expect in, in, in quantum geometry or quantum. Um, gravity not to have an aspect that is related to the metric. So it does not use the concept of the path and it is thus generalizable to quantum spaces. Um, excuse me just a second. So are there any questions uh, so far? About, for example, the motivation or, or, or any other thing?
Sorry, I have a bug here that is sort of bugging me. I will share the screen one more time. Okay. So, um, so in order to prove to you that this this corresponds truly to to sort of. Um, you know, for example, in, in the case of the real line, that that corresponds to um, something as a, as a distance function. Uh, you consider here the trivial function h, uh, which is, you know, it just maps x into x, so it's the unit uh, function. And we show next that it corresponds to a supremum, which means a supremum, which means um, that d of pq is equal to, you know, h of p minus h of q, and this is really equal to p of minus p minus q. Now, first note, so for the proof, um, first note that uh, H is, is uh, C, so it's, it's continuous, okay, for R, and it has a derivative that is continuous as well, and um, the derivative of H is equal to one, which is less equal to one, which is one of the conditions that we have to fulfill for all X in R, and thus H is in the set defining the supremum, okay? Now suppose H is not the supremum, that then there must exist a function F, which is S, you know, from S1 of R, such that F prime of X is less equal to one for all X element R, okay? Um, sorry, yeah. This would imply that F of P minus F of Q is bigger than H of minus P, Minus, sorry, h of p minus h of q. And this implies that f of p minus f of q is bigger than p minus q. But now by the mean value theorem, there exists a c, a constant between p and q, such that the mean value of f prime of c is equal to f minus p, f of p, minus f of q, the absolute value of that, divided by p minus q. And thus from the two previous equations, we deduce that f prime of c has to be uh, greater than one, and this is in direct contradiction with uh, f prime of x being less equal to one. Okay, and thus we have uh, uh, equality. Um, okay. So. Um, so the distance on R is expressed as a premium. Uh, we already said that, sorry, I went back. All right, so now uh, the, in, in the operator framework, so our approach to non commutative geometry in order to make the distance functions computable with operators and states as in quantum mechanics. So you see now we have a, a theory basically or a definition of, of, the, of the distance in contrary to, to, in contrast to the one that uh, was in the infimum. Uh, that does not rely really on points, but the points are replaced by states and functions by operators. And the way to do that is the following. For, I just want to tell you a quick joke, sort of. Um, Non-commutative geometry, um, you know, deals with uh, or, or tries to basically formulate a lot of geometrical aspects without the notion of a point. And thus, uh, somewhat, sometimes it's sarcastically called the pointless geometry, which is a sort of mean and, and, and funny at the same time. Okay, I just wanted to tell you. And now uh, the point is we, we define a state omega p, which is associated to each point p as follows. So omega p of f is equal to f of p. This is now our state. So it's a positive linear function. That is what the state is. And next we write the sub expression f prime of x less equal than zero for all x element r to make it compatible with the operator theory. Now, the way we do it is exactly by the way I showed you by taking the representation. So, um, since, since x is uh, the, the, you know, since x, x hat was the, uh, how did I say that one best? So, x hat was the multiplication operator basically on functions of L2, right? But 
or you know uh, to be more precise on a dense subspace of L2. Okay, and now that means that any function f can be written. So, right, and now you can take a function of this x hat, phi of x, you know, and, oh yeah, and, and now the x hat here represents the representation of the original algebra. So basically, you, yeah, you can write pi of f of x hat or pi of x hat psi of x. Um, and this is then just simply, you know, phi this this thing. There, I mean, x hat and p hat are um, self-adjoint operators, and for all normal operators, there exists, you know, the the, the 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 spectral theorem. And with the spectral theorem, you can actually do exactly things like that. That is why it is also very useful in physics. And so we can write any function, you know, uh, even if it's, you know, a uh, function of an operator, let's say, for example, I don't know, e to the power of x hat, you know, as a multiplication on, you know, a subset of L2. Then f prime of x less equal one is equivalent to saying that the norm of uh, the, the commutator of t dx f is less equal to one, okay, where this is the operator norm, okay, because I mean, you can always take the operator norm. There is no reason to, to not do it. Now, the proof here is the following. Take the commutator of ddx with f on psi. This gives you ddx f psi minus f ddx psi, right? Because the commutator is just, you know, the commutator of ab is just ab minus ba. And this gives you then, you know, the, the Leibniz rule. So this acts on this. So this is basically f prime psi plus f psi prime. And since this is f psi, so this minus f psi prime, this cancels and you have f psi c. So in a sense, the, the, the formulation of this f prime as an operator with a commutator is justified here. And the operator norm is simply given by the supremum. Um, let me clear this for a second. Okay, so therefore the norm is less equal to one and it is, is equivalent to that the supremum is less equal to one, which in turn is equivalent to f prime of x is less equal to one. Hence, finally, the supremum expression is rewritten in the operator framework as the following. So now we, we replaced, you know, the point, um, so in the supreme, if you remember the supremum um, definition, we had uh, d of p q is equal to the supremum of f of p minus f of q, you know, um, such that you know you have f of um, well f of x is uh, less equal than one for all x element r, right? And now we replaced the f of p by this linear functional omega p of f and the same for f of q, such that now this is less equal to one. Thus we replaced, you know, a definition of the supremum, uh, the supremum expression for the distance by a one that is purely algebraic in a sense. And, and so here there is no, um, there's no reference to a metric. There's no reference to any weird paths and shortest path and, and, and so on that you have to take, okay? And that, that, that is sort of really one of, of, the, of the, in my opinion, of course, uh, one of the fundamentals of, of this theory and, and also one of its main aspects of beauty if, if, if something of that is of any value. And now, we come to really what is sort of one of the main aspects since we define now the distance function without reference to any geometrical entities in, a, in, a, in, in some sort of way, but rather to, to algebra, um, to elements of, of algebras basically, we define the so-called spectral triples. This is the spectral triples in a sense are one really big fundament of, um, of, of non-commutative geometry, basically. 
Right, so a spectral triple, I will define it in a moment just to tell you here, this is, it's made out of an algebra, a Hilbert space, and a derivative operator, which is usually associated with the Dirac operator. And the idea, the main idea, the main concept, you know, if you, if you take anything of, of what I'm saying with you, is that the, the, the main idea here is out of this spectral triple, so out of a spectrum of an algebra and so on, I can extract geometrical quantities, you see, such that for the case or for the time uh, that I don't have geometrical quantities to work with, I can use these triples because I know how the thing works in generality. So this is what, you know. Excuse me, can I ask yes. a very short question? Yes. Um, you probably said it, but could you remind me what those functionals um, WPF, WQF, yes. how they're defined? Um, well, oh, that is a very good question. In general. Or is it? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that is a very good question. It's a state, so it's basically a positive linear functional. How this is defined, that, that is... Um, that is a question for later or maybe, I mean, okay, I don't know if fine. I will answer it to you, but you know, there's this GNS construction thing where, you know, you, if you, if you have given a C star algebra and so on, and then you can construct those states. So in, in basically, um, and you can reconstruct the geometrical entities of, of this, um, this algebra, but basically to tell you the truth, um, one big aspect of working, for example, uh, on quantum field theories in curved space times, you have an algebra given, and if you can construct a state which is a positive linear functional, then you can construct your whole Hilbert space and do rigorous, you know, uh, work and 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 calculations on that. But that is a very good question, and in general, I, I don't think anyone has you know the real answer to it. But it's an okay. absolutely great question. Yeah. I mean, here it basically just you know identifies f of p sort of because you see it is positive and it is linear because f of p plus f and so on so this is basically that right now very good question okay thanks i thought i have to miss it but yeah that makes no, sense no, no, you haven't missed it at all i i sort of yeah uh rushed it because uh, yeah so um now we come to the con spectral triple so um and and as i told you from an intuitive point of view a spectral triple encodes the 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 all the geometrical information but in an algebraic way they, they, and, and please if you take any sentence with you it would be maybe this you know the non-commutative geometry aspect of con and especially in regards to spectral triple is encode the geometrical information in an algebraic way because for the case that you don't have the geometric information but the algebraic information, you plug that in and then you should be able to obtain the geometrical one. Of course, the, it's not that easy and straightforward. You know, it's not a, a formula that is, I mean, in non-commutative algebra and geometry in, 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 in general, everything uh, seems to be always very hard. But uh, that makes it probably interesting. Okay, so... Let me give you a, an explicit definition of this spectral triple. A spectral triple is given by A, H, and D, and um, so by an algebra, a Hilbert space, and some derivative operator, which is a self adjoint operator. So it is composed of a unital C star algebra. And I just noticed I didn't define what a C star algebra is. Oh. Okay, um, please write in the chat, who of you know the definition of a C star algebra or are, are sort of familiar or, or who isn't, who isn't maybe, that, that would be the more important question. Okay, perfect. Perfect. Um, remember, remember the, the, uh, this, yeah, I don't know. Um, I mean, I, I will define everything from the very beginning. Here I just give a general teaser aspect, but then we will go really more rigorous and rigorous. So don't, don't be intimidated right now. 
I will just give you the very definition and then we will go very clear into, you know, the introductory definitions of all that. So, um, uh, and while I'm on it, um, how familiar are, are you? So is anyone not that familiar with Hilbert space or Hilbert spaces? I mean, not everyone has to be, of course. But I, I got a lot for my pointless geometry joke that I, I'm seeing right now. Um, that, that is nice. So, um, okay. So I, I will go in, in more detail. Um, the point is, so uh, and I, as I said, you have an algebra, some algebra, which, okay, is a unical CSA algebra. I will explain in more detail what that means. You have a Hilbert space and you have a self-adjoint operator D, um, which, you know, is a Dirac operator or, or sort of some, some sort of operator with a compact resolvent such that the commutator of D with A is bounded for all A element A. That is the crucial aspect here. And in this context, if you have two states, sigma and sigma prime, their distance is defined by the supremum of A element A of the you know, mean value of sigma A minus sigma prime of A um, for the case that the norm of the commutator of DA is less equal to one, because this is basically what bounded means, modulo a constant, right? Okay, just to give you a very easy example, okay, for which you don't need to know a lot actually, um, the, 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 the example of a Riemannian manifold. So you know what a Riemannian manifold is. Uh, I guess more, many of you, probably most of you know it better than, than I do. But uh, the, the, uh, so you have, let's say you have a compact Riemannian manifold, okay? So it means that your functions are, are basically all very well defined and so on. And um, a, spectra, a spectral triple on this Riemannian manifold um, is defined in the following way. The algebra, so what is a spectral triple again? like this here. So a spectral triple, as I said, is algebra, Hilbert space, and Dirac operator, right? And, um, right, and, and the, the algebra is basically just the algebra of the continuous functions over that manifold, okay? So you don't, um, right, you don't take any, so it's nothing fancy, you know, just the, 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 the algebra of the continuous functions. So you have a continuous function and um, if, so what is an algebra? An algebra, you know, is, is some, some set such that you can multiply their elements and they stay in that set. You can add their elements, they stay in that set. And an algebra over a ring, you can take elements of the ring, multiply it by elements of that algebra and it stays in that set. Basically that's all what an algebra is. So uh, I will give a more, you know, precise definition in, in a second. But the point is, what does it mean or what is important? You have f of x and you have g of x, okay? And they're both continuous functions on, on this manifold that is compact. Now, if I add those two continuous functions, I will get a third continuous, a uh, third function that is continuous. And if I multiply those two functions, right? So uh, this is f of x, g of x, I will also get a, a uh, function that is continuous. You can, actually, this is a very nice exercise to prove why, why f of x times g of x is continuous if f of x and g of x is continuous. This holds, of course, also for non-compact um, non manifolds, but uh, this is not that very important. So in, in a sense, you have, so inst instead of looking of the geometry, uh, you know, instead of looking on the geometry of those objects, what you look at is the algebra that they form. And, and this is sort of what is the replaced in, in non-commutative geometry. So in, in non-commutative geometry, you replace, you, you have, you, you know, instead of working on the manifold, you work with the algebra over that manifold. And as the Hilbert space, you choose some L2, so square integrable differentiable forms, you know, i.e. elements acting on point by pointwise uh, multiplication on H, H, as I explained to you before. And the choice for a first order differential operator is the Dirac operator because the square of that operator, uh, or not because, but that is a very nice property of that, that the square of the Dirac operator gives you the Laplacian, okay? So, and then you have your, your, your um, spectral triple basically. And for you who, who still remember the introductory course in differential geometry, um, 
the Laplace theorem operator satisfies the following. That is delta, so delta is d times delta plus delta times d, where d is the exterior derivative and delta is the exterior co-derivative. And um, with this exterior, exterior derivative, you can build forms, okay? So, um, so basically, I mean, uh, I don't know, is this gonna even be recorded? I'm not very sure. So, okay, take some vector space, right? Uh, I don't know, call it, uh, call it x. Okay, you have this vector space and you have functions over this vector space. Now, if you take um, the derivative, the exterior derivative um, of on elements of this vector space, basically you go from, um, from x to omega one of x, right? So the one forms, okay? So basically let's say you have an element of x, which is a, then dA is a one form. And in order to get a two form, you, you well, that you, you, you take omega one of x and wedge it with omega one of x, and that is how you build your n forms. And one aspect which I hope we, we will reach uh, in the next lecture probably, no, not probably, most probably, most definitely, is, you know, in non commutative geometry is forget about the vector space and deal with the algebra. You take the algebra as your zero form, and then by defining and how that will, you know, um, happen, will, will, uh, we will see then because that is a little bit more complex. But, but in general, the, the idea is the same. You take an algebra and you define an exterior derivative and this exterior derivative gets you the one form. And in order to define a two form there, you just wedge, uh, or I mean, in a sense, um, you just tensor in an algebraic way, the one forms with each other. But okay, this, uh, I'm going already way too far, uh, so way more far than I wanted. And so as I told you here, the exterior derivative, you know, you have the vector space and it takes you from functions of this vector space to one form. And so with the D, you can basically always go and they have very nice names. Uh, okay. Now, um, the point is these, these are, what do what you call this? Um, null, null potent, which means that if you square them, it is equal to zero. So that means, and from that it follows that D is equal to D plus DY because if you take the square, this is d squared plus delta d plus d delta, right? Plus delta squared because the, you know, because the d and delta do not necessarily commute and in general don't. Um, and since this is zero and this is zero, you end up exactly, you know, with the Laplace and that we defined. Good. Um, okay. Okay, so now the distance between two points P and Q considered as pure states, omega P, P and omega Q is given by um, the supremum norm as we did it before. So omega P of F minus omega Q of F um, and, and such that D, you know, computed D of F is less equal than zero. And this is in a sense, the generalization of the previous formula on R. And one can recover the metric from this definition, although it is not present in this definition. And in a sense, the Dirac operator encodes the geometrical information of the metric, okay? So this is sort of, uh, yeah, that was the teaser sort of, uh, just to get you, you know, interested. And, um, right. So let me see now if you see. Okay. So, as I said, the general idea of non commutative geometry is to shift from topological spaces to algebras of functions defined on them. So next we give definitions and facts about algebras and functions on topological spaces. And this is, you know, exactly such that, I mean, main, so I'm going to go with through all definitions with you. So just that you have, you know, in, in a sense, a sort of, um, you know, aspect of, on how these, these things look. Um, Right. Sorry, before I continue, is there any, are there any wishes that, that you know, uh, regarding my style or, or something that I can, uh, that I can, oh, wait, uh, Maximilian. Yes. 
it, it is exactly that the, the, the resolvent said. Um, I will define it in a second, okay? Uh, but thank you for the question. Um, so, right, with a compact resolvent set. Oh yeah, you're right. I, I didn't, it, it slipped, it skipped my mind, it slipped my mind that uh, I, I used here the resolvent. Thank you very much for this clear question. Um, I, I will define it in a second. Is there any other, are there any other wishes? Do you want to go faster, slower? Just, just like communicate with me. Okay. So, okay, we go here through a few definitions, basically. Um, we define an algebra. So uh, what is the definition of an algebra? I gave it to you, uh, you know, previously, but let's say an algebra with a field of complex numbers uh, C. All right, I said a ring. I don't know why I said a ring. I meant a field. is a vector space over C such that the objects like alpha A plus beta B with A, B element A and alpha beta element C make sense. Okay, in a sense, you can... Um, you know, there's in there's a product. There's uh, you can add them. You can multiply these constants with them, and it's still you know in A. And um, there's a product. So the product takes an element of A with an element of A and maps it to to A, and it is distributive over uh, the addition. It is also associative. Well, it doesn't need it doesn't need to be. But in general, I will only work with associative algebras. So distributed means A times B plus C. So some product, whatever that product is, so it's not just the point-wise product. But of course, if you work uh, on, on a function space that is commutative, you have, um, so, so if you take the algebra of functions over some commutative manifold, you know, the, this is the point-wise product, basically. And uh, A plus B times C is AC plus BC, where A and B and C are all elements of the algebra. And in general, the product is not commutative. And this is exactly sort of the jumping, the jumping point, let's say, the skipping point or the, the important point in, um, you know, in, in, these, in, in these frameworks. So, well, we mostly work with unital algebras, but in, in, in general, it doesn't have to be. So unital algebra is an algebra that has also the unit element as an element of that algebra, which means you can multiply it with that element. And so A times one is, is so it's the one basically, right? Um, so, sorry, so an algebra A is called a star algebra if it admits, um, and an anti sorry, I just need to check the chat. So an algebra A is called a star algebra if it admits an antilinear involution star, which maps A into A with, with the following properties. If you take the star of the star, it is equal to A, okay? A times B star is equal to B star A star, and alpha A plus beta B star is alpha, a complex conjugated times A star plus beta complex conjugated times B star. Okay, so the bar denotes here the usual complex conjugation. So, um, I mean, I will give you examples later, but take, for example, the matrix algebra, okay, matrix algebra of two cross two matrices over C, over the complex numbers. And there, um, the, the, the involution is just, you know, the complex conjugate, let's call it, right? Okay. Um, next we define, so that was, we define an algebra, now we define the star algebra, and now next we define a normed algebra. And a normed algebra is an algebra with a norm, okay? Well, it sounds uh, like a very trivial definition. Basically, so you have an algebra that fulfills all your nice properties, and in addition, you have a norm. And a norm, you know, is, is, is a function such that it is uh, yeah, well, what a norm defines, right? So it's greater equal than zero and only zero if A is zero. It is um, such that um, the norm of alpha times A is equal to the um, mean value of alpha times the, 
norm of A, so you can take the A out sort of, and the norm of A plus B is less equal to the norm of A plus B plus the norm of B, and A times B is less equal to A times uh, the norm of B. Uh, for any A, B element A and alpha element C. Um, so, so I was younger, a little bit younger than that, than today. So actually, I was also a PhD student at the Max Planck Institute. And I was, uh, you know, I, had, I was learning functional analysis and I, I saw these definitions and it, they were very clear to me. And then I had to prove that they, that it, it is the case and I had a, ex, extremely difficulties and then I figured it out. And then I started inventing norms, okay? Just uh, for the fun of it, just to see if they fit, you know, this. The, the, it's a nice example to, to put for yourself, sort of. Um, the topology defined by the norm is called the norm topology. Okay, so the corresponding neighborhoods of A are given by uh, B element A if the norm A minus B is less equal to an epsilon. So there, there, is, a, there is a topology defined for these operators or for, for these um, algebras as well. That is basically what is important here. And um, okay, there, there you have a Banach algebra. A Banach algebra is a norm algebra, which is complete in the uniform topology, which means that all um, Cauchy, con Cauchy consequences Cauchy, what did I want to say? Cauchy sequences converge in that norm. And Banach star algebra is a norm star algebra, which is complete. So A star is, and in addition, A star is equal to the norm of A star is equal to the norm of A. And now a C star algebra. So a C star algebra is a Banach star algebra whose norm defines, uh, whose norm satisfies in additional the identity that the norm of A star A is equal to the norm of A star, A star for all A's element A. And um, the point why C star algebras are very nice um, is that, uh, for, especially in physics, we have observables. These observables are given by self-adjoint operators. And these self-adjoint operators are usually unbounded, but if we you know, exponentiate them, then they, in a certain way, then be, they become unbounded, uh, uh, bounded, and, and they form sort of a, a, a C star algebra together. And with C star algebra, there are very important results, as I mentioned, the GNS construction theorem and so on, that, that make them very useful in day-to-day -day life, so, so to speak. Um, right, so, so this, I, I hope, you know, my quick um, sort of introduction to these things uh, made the definitions easier. Now, um, the, right, so in, I will give you a few examples, just, you know, what, what the hell did I just define in a sense? So the commutative algebra C of M of continuous functions on a compact host of topological space, okay, so this is an example, with start denoting the complex conjugation and the norm given by the supremum norm, okay? So, um, right, you, the, the space has to be compact because otherwise this can explode, right? So this is the supreme norm, and this, this defines you a, a C star algebra, okay? Um, right. Now, if M is not compact, you take the algebra C0 of M of continuous functions that vanish at, uh, at infinity, right? So, um, so if, if M is, is not compact, then, you know, then you have trouble with defining this supreme norm. So a nice exercise, I mean, I don't know how invested you are in this ring for this, but uh, if you have time and you have, I don't know, 10 minutes to, to, to spare sort of, um, uh, you, you can prove that this example is truly uh, an, an algebra and, and especially a C star algebra. Okay, um, another a nice example of an, uh, so the, right, so what I should also mention is, here you have a commutative algebra, right? This algebra is a commutative algebra. Okay, this algebra is a commutative algebra, right? Um, because um, f of x times g of x, okay, for functions, you know, continuous functions, actually continuous is not even that important. Uh, is equal to g of x times f of x if this multiplication is the pointwise multiplication. But in general, this doesn't have to be the case, right? And 
maybe let me say uh, mention here one example of a very nice non-commutative algebra. Um, maybe I will mention it later, but just just because it fits here so nice. Um, so you you say well okay, give me the commutative algebra over continuous functions. How does an, a non-commutative algebra over these continuous functions look like? And then I give you a product. Okay, it's 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 basically just in the product. The product, let's say f star g of x, or no, let's define it a little bit different. Sorry. Let me find it that way. Um, f of x times g of x is given as e to the power of one half theta i j d i d j. Uh, well, I could write it like this. And d j um, g of x. Okay, where f and g are now an element of that. So this is a product, okay? So this is the derivative with respect to x, and this only, you know, this is an exponential function. You can represent it as an integral. It has very nice integral representation. But it, I mean, in this way, you know, a hardcore sort of mathematician who brute forces everything knows what it means. It means I have an exponential, I can do a Taylor expansion, and the d i acts on f of x, and this dj acts on g of x. And theta ij is some skew symmetric uh, matrix, okay, in um, it is, and constant matrix. So it's theta ij. It's just as you know, some practical matrix if you want. And i and j go from one to two. Let's say in that case, this is just the epsilon tensor uh, times some constant. And this constant is what they call a deformation constant because if this constant goes to zero, okay, if theta goes to zero. So this is this product is usually denoted by star theta. So in the limit theta goes to zero, f of x star theta g of x go to the pointwise product. Okay, and that is what is sort of the nice thing about these things. You can go from one to another, and a lot of you know fundamental physical theories can be actually understood as a deformation, is what this is called. Um, of of classical theories, but okay. So take this product, this non-commutative product, and then you will see that you know for uh, continuous functions on a compact uh, manifold, that that this will still give you you know uh, an algebra. So if you multiply two, they will still be a continuous function and so on, even with that product. Okay, that that's uh, just a little bit of a okay. Now, um, so the non-commutative algebra, so an example of a non-commutative algebra is the, and one in which is very important, by the way, um, is, is the algebra of bounded linear operators on an infinite dimensional Hilbert space, right? So, um, right, so you, you have a bounded linear operator means, on a Hilbert space means you have a norm on this Hilbert space, which is given as a supremum norm. And this supremum norm is finite, okay? So the non commutative algebra B of H of bounded linear operators on an infinite dimensional Hilbert space with the involution given by the adjoint and the norm given by the operator norm gives you a normed C star algebra, uh, a normed, uh, well, a C star algebra, basically. So a normed uh, star Banach algebra that is complete. Okay, and a very, you know, a sort of particular case of this example is as I mentioned before also the non-commutative algebra given by n cross n matrices uh, on on the complex vector space and where t star is a Hermitian conjugate of t so you have a matrix and and the the, the conjugation which is important as you as you see here um, to make an algebra a star algebra you need some sort of um, some sort of operation which you know defines you the involution and um, right, and this is just the Hermitian conjugate of T. And the norm, there are many norms, and it's a very nice um, thing in linear algebra. You already do that is is to prove that many of these norms are equivalent by showing you know some 
certain inequalities. And so the norm of t is the positive square root of the largest eigenvalue of t star t, okay? So, I mean, t star t is a, is a self-adjoint operator, a self-adjoint matrix. And if you take um, the positive square, so, I mean, you can calculate for that matrix, the eigenvalue equation, and then you take the largest eigenvalue and take the square root. Basically, that's, that's all there is to it. All right. Um, Right. Okay. Um, now, so I gave you some examples of C star algebras and algebras in general of commutative ones and non commutative ones. Um, and uh, they're very, I mean, it's a beautiful theory with incredible many uh, results that, that are mind blowing uh, once one understands what the hell they're talking about. But uh, so, so they're, it, it's really, uh, I mean, it's really uh, some, something else, the, these theories. So I recommend anyone to, to read about c star algebras in general, just to, to get a sort of general idea of what, what is happening there. Um, another definition that we will use, maybe not that often, but I will still bring it in, is the, the, the definition, uh, the, the notion of an ideal. So a proper norm closed subspace I of the algebra A is a left ideal, respectively a right ideal. If A is an element of A and B is an element of this I, imply that a times b is in i okay respectively right ideal if uh, b times so if a is an element a and b element e such that b times a is an element a, uh, i a two-sided ideal is one which is both so it's a left ideal and a right ideal and the ideal i is called maximal if there exists no other ideal of the same kind in which e which i is contained okay so that is an ideal. Ideal means, okay, I have an algebra, I have some elements of this algebra, and now I have a subset of this algebra, a subspace of this algebra. I take the, those elements, I multiply it with the algebra, and they stay you know, in this smaller sub-algebra because the ideal is also a sub-algebra. Also a very nice you know, example if you want to calculate it. And now um, to the question of Maximilian, is um, the, the resolvent, um, uh, set and uh, sorry, of, uh, of I said Maximilian. Is it true or was it Marcus? No, it was Maximilian. Perfect. So, um, so things are annoying me. Okay. The resolvent set R of A. So. Right, so let me define what the resolvent set means. Of an element of an algebra is the subset of C such that lambda is an element C and A minus this lambda element of C is invertible, okay? Where, you know, one, this is the one in, in C. And for any lambda element R of A, so uh, A minus lambda I is called the resolvent of A at lambda, okay? So that is the resolvent set. Now, why is this resolvent set important? There is actually a lot of work on, on the resolvent set and a lot of very interesting, important theorems on it as well. Um, what I actually, well, I mean, for, you, for those of you who are familiar with the Weyl algebra, the resolvent algebra, which is basically the algebra made out of these resolvent sets, um, is a very nice sub-algebra to it, okay? And, or basically you can, you can do a lot, what you can do with the Weyl algebra, you can do with the resolvent algebra to a certain extent. And actually you can even do more and this is still subject of, of current work. But I mean, in general, why we need it is that the complement of this resolvent algebra, or uh, sorry, of this re resolvent set in C is called the spectrum of A. What does the spectrum mean? This, oh, I wrote it here in a German, way. So the spectrum uh, for any element of a C star algebra is a non-empty compact subset of C. Okay. Um, so, okay. So you, you take the resolvent algebra. Okay. And the complement of that uh, resolvent set or resolved algebra is the, is the spectrum. Okay. And what is nice about C star algebras is that the spectrum for any element of these algebras is a non-compact, a non-empty compact subset of C. Now, 
the spectral radius of A is given by the supremum of lambda, lambda element of Ri. Um, right, so that's the spectral. And if A is a C star algebra, this spectral radius is just a norm. And what is even nicer is when this element that I'm looking at is a self-adjoint operator or a self-adjoint element, right? So an element A is called a self-adjoint self if A is equal to A star. And, um, well, I mean, yes. I mean, for an algebra, this, this should hold. You know, I mean, the point is for bounded operators, so for a matrix, a matrix is called self-adjoint if, if A is equal to A star, right? But for unbounded operators, this is a little bit more complicated because as, a, as the discussion before, you have to take care of the domain. Okay, um, and the spectrum sigma of A uh, of is, so for a self-adjoint operator is real. And, and that is basically what makes self-adjoint operators, uh, especially in physics, so important because at the end of the day, you want to measure a number, right? A number means a real number. So with a complex number, we cannot do that much, but a real number, which means, I don't know, you measure, the temperature, right? Temperature is a real number. Now it's, I don't know, in my room, it's 24 degrees, 24.9 degrees. Okay, this is the number. Um, and and, and in, in order for an observable, you know, in, in, in quantum mechanics to, to have a real spectrum, it has to be self-adjoint. So a real spectrum of, of A means that A is self-adjoint. And uh, that means it's basically the, the the spectrum is a subset of um, the interval minus norm of a to a. Okay, on sigma of a of square, sigma of a square is a subset of the interval zero to norm of a square. Um, what is so? Okay, may, maybe what you only take with you from here is self-adjoint element of an algebra means I have a real spectrum. Now, if a is an addition to um, oh, is, is self-adjoint and it is called positive if the spectrum is a subset of the positive half line, okay? So A is positive if and only if A can be written as a product of B star B for some, you know, arbitrary element B in A. Okay, so I know th this is a little bit, uh, well, we say in, in, in Austria, Zach, which means like a little bit boring, but uh, these are definitions nevertheless, and I think it's, it's nice to have them there. You know, in any case, you can always look them up. Um, now, a star isomorphism between two C star algebra. So, okay, basically all the definitions I give you, I will use later on, okay? So please apologize uh, for the, the massive use of them. So a star isomorphism between the C star algebras A and B is any C linear map pi, which maps the algebra A to B, satisfying, so the algebra A to the algebra B, satisfying P, pi of A times B is equal to pi of A times pi of B, where the product here, let me, let me. so in general, the product here and the product here do not have to be the same, right? Um, so, so it's a sarophosomorphism or a representation as well. Um, which we will define in a second, if P A of star is equal to P A P of A star. Um, um, yes. I have a very quick question. Do yes. we require it to be invertible in some sense or? The, the because we call it an isomorphism. Right, um, yes, it has to be, right. I'm sorry, this, this should have been written there. Yes, it has to be uh, invertible and Right, so yeah, you're right. This, this should, I, I think this follows nevertheless from this definition. There are a lot of equivalent definitions, but yeah, you're right. This, this should actually, so there should exist an inverse that basically does the same. And I think you can get that out by taking pi inverse of this one. Yeah. Um, and now, we come to the, the, the most important thing. So uh, what I was telling you before, um, I was saying to you before for an unbounded, um, for an unbounded, for unbounded operators, and this is the last definition before we close this session. Um, 
so let me give it to you now for bounded operators in C star algebra as made of bounded operators. A representation of a C star algebra A is a pair, H and pi, where H is a Hilbert space and uh, pi is a star morphism between A, so the, the C star algebra A, and the, um, the C star algebra of bounded operators on the Hilbert space. In addition, the representation H pi is called faithful if the kernel of pi is, uh, is the zero space, is the null space. Uh, in the case that you don't have a C star algebra, by the way, you would have H, pi, and D, where A is, right, so where pi is a, is a, is a map between, is a star morph or, a, yeah, actually, it's, well, now there is also a little difference there. It's basically um, a mapping between A and, you know, some uh, dense subspace of H, okay? That, that would constitute then in the, it for the unbounded case, okay? Um, right, okay. I, I think this is a good stopping point. I, I hope I didn't, you know, uh, suffocate you all with all these definitions and so on but i mean it's it's important so that because in, in later i will um later i will i will sort of explain explain the following and maybe i will put it now very precise you have an algebra you have a given algebra you have a hilbert space so an algebra given on some function space for example you have a hilbert space that you define and then you have a Dirac operator or some derivative operator. By taking those three, you can reconstruct the underlying geometry of the space. And how to do that, in order to do that, and how to do it, all these definitions come into play, okay? So that, that's maybe why they're important. But uh, yeah, so I, I think, yeah, yeah I should uh, end this session for today. Are there any other questions so far? No, and I, I mean, oh, I hope not because I mean, I think I would have to prepare. No, I think I mean, look, the the general idea, as I as as far as I remember it, and I, and I talked with uh, your scientific coordinator, Jörg Lennart, about it, is um, is is it, it's 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 sort of a little bit uh, unfortunate that we always go, you know, you do your PhD in something, and and then you remain in that area. And you don't know in this, you, you start forgetting slowly all your other stuff that you learn in your math studies or in your physics studies, and you don't uh, see general pictures of things. And I think that the, the swing fallism was really in, in the spirit for you to see a general, you know, idea of, of what goes on beyond your, uh, beyond your subject or, or area of expertise, just to get a general idea. I don't think there will be an exam and I will, I mean, no, I don't think there is an exam, no. And I, I would definitely uh, do all in my power to avoid that uh, as well, because I would have to write it and I would have to grade it as well. And I, I don't think, you know, now I, it's also not fair. I mean, the, the, with three sessions, yes. Any other questions, remarks? Well, if not, then, then I thank you all for your attendance. I, I, I hope you know you could you can take something with you and uh, we see each other the next two fridays until then i i wish you a nice weekend <laughs>